Am I ready? You are ready. I'm ready. Okay. Let me start this off by saying, mm -hmm. good evening. Good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Shalom. When I started this, guten tag. Alafia. My name is Odie Hawkins, and I'd like to answer a question that a few of my friends, the readers of my book, have asked. Why do you keep switching genres on us? Your books seem to wander all over the place. Okay. I can appreciate the question, and I would like to answer it by saying, I feel the human condition and all of what that means is my genre. I mean, who said that I'm supposed to be just a, 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 a country and western singer? Yes. Or a mystery writer or a detective story, you know, so that's the answer to that. Or a poet. A poet. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, okay, for example, there's a, there's a strongly devout anti-racist thread running through all of my 30 odd books. I have a number of concerns that I've interwoven within the fabric of my works. For example, I think there should be complete equality between men and women, all men, all women. Uh, whoever is the best qualified for the job should get it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I learned that from my mom, <laughs> who showed me early on who was uh, the strongest. She was. And she wasn't lifting weights. Uh, she didn't have any muscles. But she had a powerful way of making you understand who was the boss. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. that's all I'll say about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, anyway, all I'm saying is that I find one genre too limited. So, in this book, Los Angeles, let me move my cup out of the way here for a moment. Mm-hmm. I've interwoven, uh, I guess you call little vignettes and short stories and whatnot. And for those who have been following, uh, Palmer and Lerner, Ralph and Yvonne, Alfred, Sir Lord Alfred Reeves, mm -hmm. James Butler, uh, our other uh, uh, Tai Chi classmates who might be tuning in from time to time, please know that I love you with all my heart. I'm sorry, it's on this side. <laughs> you get a little confused if you stay by yourself a long time. Oh. Luckily, I got Zola over there behind the camera, uh -huh. who was by my side. Oh, you got that, that right. <laughs> so I'm starting off on chapter 14, mm -hmm. or should I say, uh, I'm probably going to be ending this by chapter 15. Oh. Okay. This one is a little bit more poetic, I think, at the beginning. Uh, as you remember, the last story ended with uh, uh, the, the Zen custodian mm -hmm. and what he did and how he wound up giving up his soul for a piece of chicken. Yes. His spiritual soul, put it that way. Hey. <laughs> Chapter 13. Freebasing nights, days and nights, feeling for that feeling again. No reason why, just an urgent desire. Why now? Why not now? You go to my head, you make my temperature rise. You go to my head like a summer with a thousand Julys. Love songs from a damaged diva's heart. Mysterious catalysts, bright shadows. A sun slash day in 1947, Ruby D was doing it in something called Uncle Tom's Cabin. For those who do not remember who Ruby D was, check her out. She and Aussie Davis. John Hope Franklin was getting off into our story way back then. Not his story, our story. Langston Hughes and Frank Yerby were getting down. 
E.J. Dezalwe and Jackie Robinson broke the color bar in big league white skin baseball. The melodically slurred sounds of Eric Dolphy, Hubert Laws, Albert Eiley, Bird, Farrell, Sun Ra, Toshiko Mariano, Train, Miles, and Dez. Cool doings from Cecil Taylor, Armando Parazza, Billy Mitchell, and Al McKibben. Tainted smoke from deeply sinned, center cut pork chops, three day old catfish grease, apicoy fires from black beans, red beans, limas, barbecued ribs, hickory smoke, fried snowballs, hip games, run on the heart, soleta, solea, serigias, charcoal flamenco. Blackness zigzagging into skag, junkie of the year, closed avenues to life, dope, dope. A shooting gallery, doo doo drop on nodding heads from too far above. Miles ahead, the birth of cool breezes, God in his heaven, the devil in his shell, all the rest of us in between. Never on Sunday. Sunday is a good day for a crucifixion, Lulu the, the whole one said. How many nights, how many times had he taken a woman to the Southern Hotel <clears throat> right over there on Drexel Boulevard and 47th Street? The, the Sutherland Hotel and Lounge did Sassy Salvan, Charming Comet McCray, Trains Train, Train, Cannonball, Mc, McCart Tyner, Elvin Jones, Polynesian things going on in 401. Snatches of all kinds of music, music mixed with, with sub -Sur Saharan chorales, oohs, canoons, heavy splashes of musical textures on the brain. Snatches of all kind of music. Aretha, Donnie, Roberta, Billy, Muddy, Bessie, Channel, Ravi, Umu, Subalakshmi, Northern, Southern, Eastern, Western. The alley running east to west parallel to Roosevelt Boulevard on the near west side filled with Ryan's car, fornicating feral cats, books printed in Hebrew, wraps with fangs as large as number two pencils. Battered musical instruments, pants, shirts, hats, scarves, plumes, magazine for Nepal, Germany, Swaziland, the diary of a man who had killed himself, a voice, an atmosphere, the art of our lives, living and loving for a day in a way that has nothing to do with tattered buildings or other phallic symbols, a soft, sweet, velvet touch, the moisture of thick lips on effervescent souls. Life, love, rhythms, women, and facts undiminished by all the fears running the world. No huge bronze earrings, 10 hour cornrow sessions, no real need for false grace and excessive charm, just grits in the nitty gritty. Dance inside a bleeding heart, conquering madness with a sway of the hips, canceling subscriptions to genocidal notions with the simple act of loving, of loving. The dazzling counterpoint of extended measures, or not just for your time, but an extended beat. Achebe said, things do fall apart. The Aquarian age, writing, become more aware, perceptive, imaginative, artless, skillful, moods. The next section of this is called Dream Dashes Marathon Memories. For those of you who are hip to track, you know that a dash is quick. It doesn't take very much time. You run a hundred yard dash, don't you, Zola? Fifty and hundred. Fifty yes. and hundred, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it doesn't take you long to run fifty yards or to run a hundred yards. No, nine point seven. But hey, that's your time. Look at yeah. you. Uh -huh. uh, and. Running a marathon is much longer because it much takes much longer, uh, maybe all yes. day long. Yeah. So challenge one's asthmatic self. <laughs> okay, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, these particular things, these particular pieces, are arranged in terms of dashes and marathons. Fantastic. Some are short, some are long. All right. A dash, sometimes called a sprint. He was never a teenage masturbator which meant that he could never figure out where the urge to spontaneously ejaculate came from, other than from the heat of his vivid imagination. The first time it happened left him bewildered. It happened in the middle of a serious 
Some Siberian Chicago winter, not more serious than present day serious, but serious nevertheless. He was sleeping on an army cot in a bad bones ghetto kitchenette apartment. Mom and sis were warm together in the other room under the quilted bed. Too hot to be concerned about the brother restlessly sleeping on the army cot in the other room of their two room apartment. One, two. The brother smiled at their lack of concern. They were being warm together under a couple of ragged ass quilts, but he felt he had the upper stroke because he had access to the four burner with the oven. He had discovered that he could place his cot in front of the lowered oven door like a warm moat bridge, cocoon himself in his army surplus blanket, and stick the crown of his head of his skull into the blue-white flame of the oven coils just far enough, not too far. Otherwise you have a roasted black head. And within minutes, especially if he covered his freezing head with the lower side of the blanket and his own fervent breathing, he could he could be warmed off to sleep. Or wherever the gradual warming took him to a head in the oven orgasm. It was sudden and complete. He felt the inside of his boxer shorts, snotty with exploded semen. He lay there, his right hand squeezing his dick for more of his delicious feeling. Nothing. Nothing. After a few minutes, he made several decisions. Number one, no one should know about this but him. That meant covering up the evidence. Number two, that meant getting up in the ice cold room to wrench his starchy, cinnamon, snot, dirty shorts out in the ice cold sink. And then put them back on in order to keep his secret a secret. He did that. Rinsed the overloaded, the overloaded cinnamon out of his shorts. It was years later that he discovered what a wet dream was. I'm telling you, youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> Struggled back into his ice water cold block boxes, assumed the best fetal position he could manage, and drifted off to sleep with the crown of his head in the oven, praying that he would be able to feel that feeling again. A musical marathon. It took him many years to understand the role that music had played in his life was playing in his life. There was always music accompanying whatever he did. There were huge chunks of time when he felt that music was occupying a wall of experience in his life. <clears throat> that the song, the trumpet, the sax, the conga drums, especially the congas, were backing up the rhythms of his life. Where did the congas come from? They probably came from Cuba, but the sound of the drums, the rhythms reached out at him one sultry summer night on the south side of Chicago across the street from Washington Park. He was drawn to the park where two African men were sitting, one with two congas, the other one with a pair of bongos. They were exchanging ideas. They were exchanging ideas, interweaving rhythms, enchanting the collection of Oil shattered African faces that formed a horseshoe circle in front of the two men. No one spoke, only the drums. How long did they play? Not long enough. How often did they come to the park bench to seduce them? Not often enough. It was his introduction to the seductive power of the drums and to the magic of the words that flared up in his brain started him to try, to try drumming with his ballpoint pen. It was a humid, profanely sensual summer night filled with gin, knives, perfumes, black folks in love with nuances of emotionality that were absent on other sides of the town. No one was soaking in the kind of spiritual juice that the drums stirred around. He was certain of that. The music, especially in the ghettos of the south side and the west side, supplied a kind of spiritual tourniquet. There was so much pain being inflicted on the communities of color. Mainly it was heroin, pronounced heroin, 
by the usual suspects. Heron was supposed to enable folks to bear the pain of being underprivileged, over-policed, and underprotected Africans in America. Of course, none of that happened. But in a weirdly contradictory way, Heron was one of the fuels for a whole galaxy of musicians, featuring the inimitable Charlie Parker and spiraling downwards. Miles, Stitt, Ammons, Palmer, you know what I'm talking about. Miles, Stitt, Ammons, Prez, Billy, many others, those seduced into believing that if Bird is doing what he's doing, has done what he did, then it must be the thing. It wasn't the heroin that made them great, but prevented them from becoming greater. Bird didn't make them fix, he simply became an ironic icon. Oh, I could say an ironic heroin icon. Mm -hmm. Before and after the heroin, there was the music, but there were times when the heroin simply supplied the rationale for negative behavior with no music come from anywhere. I just got to go steal something to get myself straight. What else can I do? <laughs> yeah, I cold cocked my mama and took her check. So what? Hey, I'm a dope fiend. That's what dope fiend do, did? Mm-hmm. All right, we turn. Uh-oh. <laughs> and that's the way it went down during that period of time. Mm-hmm. The martial arts, a marathon for sure. Mm -hmm. He had no idea that the beginning of the basic, of his basic survival skills, stemmed from knowing how to deliver the right punch to the right place. Bing, bing, bing. Back in the day, that particular knowledge could only be acquired on a reliable basis on the near west side of Chicago. Near was the political designation for black, just the way South Central stood for black in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm before South Los Angeles was substituted for black. Mm -hmm. Maybe the redesignation was necessary because so many Hispanics had infiltrated South Central. Mm -hmm. What the what? what? Let's leave the demo drama to more racially demonstrative peers and get on with it. Mm -hmm. It took him a few days of reflection once he had realized the importance of the martial arts he played in his life was playing in his life. He started doing a freeform review fist fighting in the bare knuckles era of Chicago's near west side and near south side of Chicago. As I previously mentioned, near was the code name for black. It was his introduction to the martial art, then called Dukin. Mm -hmm. You want to do? Mm -hmm. Years later, he was introduced to a more sophisticated form of Dukin called Hapkido. Mm -hmm. The Korean version of Dukin included kicking, grappling, pressure point application, using leveraging techniques to allow opponents to defeat, defeat himself. Different stuff. Mm -hmm. Right on the heels of Harpedo came Taekwondo, hand and foot way. Another sophisticated method of duking. Each of the Korean martial arts carried a heavy responsibility to be in superior condition and in a positive state of mind. <laughs> <laughs> no heroin here. <laughs> Later, as though all of the other martial arts had been prerequisites, Capoeira Hegenau and Capoeira Angola came onto the scene. After the drudgery of struggling with Hapkido and Taekwondo, both forms of Capoeira were like beacons signaling the way to a brighter path. Mm. He gave a bigger share of the credit to Capoeira Hegenau and Capoeira Angola for acting as beacons for a brighter future but he never denied the importance of learning the hard lessons taught by the Koreans, Aikido and Taekwondo. Never give up, mm -hmm. never surrender to apathy, and always think of what can be done to clear up a muddy situation. Thank you, Master Lee, Master Ken, Raymond de Silva, the spirits of the Doja. Mm -hmm. Nice. Uh, how do you say in Korean, thank you? Kamsamida. Kamsamida. Mm -hmm. uh, listen to you speak Korean. <laughs> Bibimbap. <laughs> Kimchi. <laughs> Kimchi, I like. <laughs> hey, I heard that. Okay. Dream Dasher. Dream Dasher. In Mary's basement, 1150 West Washburn Avenue, the near south side, way back when. 
Even when he was a 10-year-old living in her basement, he felt that there was something special about Aunt Mary. He would never have thought of her as one of those extraordinary African-American women from deep East Mississippi who had figured a lot of stuff out early in the game. He didn't become aware of what she had figured out early in the game. He didn't become aware of what she had figured out till years after he had moved away from the basement and the circumstances she had shared with him. She never worked for the white folks. That was a fact that really meant a lot when many African Americans were held in wage peonage or worse. She had never worked for the white folks. And as the owner of a weekend gambling spot, she had the white folks working for her, in a sense. He would always remember the Friday evenings when Tarzan and Short Coat, <laughs> <laughs> Tarzan and Short Coat, mm -hmm. two of the local bribe scrounging cops would slither down into the basement to try to squeeze a bit of bread off of her. Uh, look, officers, mm -hmm. now I done told y'all that uh, I know y'all need money, but the game ain't really going on yet. The heavy rollers ain't come in yet. I ain't take in, I ain't took in too much. So I can't give y'all but forty dollars. Why don't y'all come back a little later for a few more coins? The heavy rollers is in uh, on the way. Oh uh, come on out, Mary. You can come up with more than forty bucks. Hey, look at here, Shout Coat. Because he wore an overcoat that was too short for his six foot plus frame, she told him. I didn't tell y'all I ain't made no money yet. Come back later and I'll see if I can sweeten up that party. Standing up to the bribe scrounging cops made a big impression on him. How tall was she? Five, two or something like that? And strong. Strong sister was strong. Dash. She was married to a man named Percy, but their marriage seemed to be more of a business arrangement than anything else because she had lovers, larger, younger, and darker. Uncle Percy didn't seem to notice. And if he had, he probably would have killed somebody because he had served 11 years in Leavenworth Penitentiary for uh, shooting a man across the table at a gambling house who had cheated, some cheated on him and cheated some money from him. And uh, I believe the pistol held uh, maybe nine shots, something like that. And he reloaded with the other nine, 10, 11. And he reloaded his pistol with the other two bullets in there and shot him, shot him 11 times. So he went to uh, Leavenworth Prison for 11 years, and they used to call him 11, 11, 11. Because he had <laughs> shot the man 11 times, <laughs> been sentenced 11 years in Leavenworth. <laughs> so he was not a punk. <laughs> and man was bold, I'm telling you. To say the least. Uncle Percy died. Hey, I heard that. Mm -hmm. Uncle Percy was a marathon man. This is chapter 14. Mm -hmm. If ever there was one. Physically, he could have been one of the latter-day Kenyan Ethiopian 24-mile champions or brother of Mahatma Gandhi. Mm. He was small, but he controlled the Friday, Friday and Saturday night crap games. Mm -hmm. Most of the men who came down into a mayor's basement to gamble were physically bigger. Chicago stockyard workers who slugged cattle in the head for a living. <clears throat> I went to the stockyard one day with Uncle there was a man standing over there like they had cattle coming up a ramp mm -hmm. and he would slug him in the head with a 16 pound sledgehammer. Yes. I never saw anything that devastated in my life. Mm -hmm. He knocked them dead. Everyone. Wow. <sighs> All day long. All day long. That's what he did. They all... mm, that must have helped his psyche a lot. I'm sure he took a break for lunch, but you know, who knows. <laughs> <laughs> Chicago stockyard workers who slow cattle in the head for a living or cut up pieces of beef wheeling past them on an assembly line, but they all had mad respect for Uncle Percy. Mm -hmm. Peeking through the worn curtain that separated the front room with scattered children sleeping on makeshift beds, he witnessed this scene one night. Stop the dice! Give me the dice! Stem me the dice! Uncle Percy called out in his gravelly high-pitched voice. Let me do that again. Stop the dice! Give me the dice! Uncle Percy called out in his gravelly high pit for it. Give me the goddamn dice now! He had no idea what was happening when Uncle Percy got a glass of water and dropped the dice into the water three, four times. Hmm. 
while the heavy roller stood around the table frowning in an ugly way. He had no way of knowing at the time that Uncle Percy was conducting a forensic dice interrogation. Mm -hmm. It was determined by this water in the glass dice examination that a couple of South Side hustlers had decided to try, try to drop shaved dice down on their country West Side colleagues and got busted in the middle of their act by Uncle Percy. Let me explain that a little bit. Ooh. If you shoot dice, you can take uh, maybe a, a nail file and file it off if you're good enough at it because people who do know how to do it know how to do it. You can shave it off to just to the point where the dice will automatically roll on to seven hmm. or whatever, three. Right. So no, not people shame. know how right. to do that know mm -hmm. how to do it. How Uncle Percy recognizes that was happening is something that I don't know about. Mm -hmm. Once it was clearly established that the South Side Hustlers were guilty of trying to play dirty dice, a few of the frowning men, the losers, took them into the alley behind the, the basement and spanked the shit out of them. <laughs> With a couple of two by fours. <laughs> okay. With a couple of two by fours and told them to stay from, away from marriage joint. Yeah. Uh huh. Nobody was mafia slaughtered, just spanked and dismissed. By with two by fours. With two by fours, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. You get a real interesting spanking out of that. I bet it wasn't all on their butt. Oh, right <laughs> on the boo boo. Uh -huh, sure. No telling what would have happened if they had decided to divide, de defy the advice that they were forced to accept. Uncle Percy was the man when it came to gambling house etiquette. The gamblers could gamble, grumble, whine, win, and or you lose, but fist fighting, knife cutting, or high blown cussing was discouraged. If Uncle Percy said, All right now, y'all, that's enough of that, then that's where the rubber met the road. Uncle Percy was a shot caller, a super psychologist, and a <laughs> convicted murderer. <laughs> the part of him... Talented. <laughs> he, had, he, had, he had some... Hidden talents. He had, he had hidden talents, you got that right. The part about him being a shot caller and a super psychologist was in evidence every weekend. The convicted murderer number, like a whole collection thing, didn't surface till years later. Years later, after the basement had become a cold storage bin, he found out that Uncle Percy had once served 11 years in Leavenworth Penitentiary for shooting a man 11 times. The way it was told to me is this. They got into it across the gambling table, and Uncle Percy pulled out a six-shooter, or the Glock, I think it was nine-shoot, and blasted this dude, reloaded his piece, and shot him some more. He served notice that he was not to be messed with. He was definitely a marathon man. Mm -hmm. Dream dashes, dot, dot, dot. Mm -hmm. Ain't married a religious person. No matter how long the crap game went on, when Sunday morning came, a Mary blossomed forth from her bedroom. Her neat little figure clothed in the Sunrise Baptist Church's red and yellow colors with the slack type uh, shoulder blades like the general that got the... Mm -hmm. She was one of the senior members of the Usherette Board. Mm -hmm. I think she was the captain. Well, like well your grandfather was a preacher, right? Yeah. yeah they had the Usher definitely. Board, right? Yeah. Yes, and most definitely. Calvary Baptist Church, half strong New York. Will you recognize? I understand. She was a member. Mm -hmm. She was one of the senior members of the Usherette Board. Mm -hmm. And going to church on Sunday meant something to her. Mm -hmm. There were days when he spent casually trying to determine what would provoke her to go to church or what would prevent her from going. It seemed that nothing could pre prevent her from going, aside from everything else. If a few gambling house regulars happened to still be on the scene, she would persuade them to go to church with her. Mm. Y'all go wash y'all hands and face and come on with me. We're going to church. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> okay. <laughs> he, <laughs> Mm -hmm. He never witnessed a refusal or an attempt to de deny her suggestion. I bet. <laughs> might be, might have got a spanking. I'm sure. 
<laughs> Perhaps they thought that going to church with the church going gambling house lady would improve their chances of winning big. Maybe. Ashe. Ashe. Dream dashes. Dot dot dot. Gotcha. Queen of the household. As a transplanted Mississippi country woman, she felt it was almost sinful to stay in bed after the sun had peeped over the horizon. Mm -hmm. It's six o'clock already. Why y'all still in bed sleeping? Woman of my own heart. <laughs> you know what you're talking about. I know what you're talking about. You get up. Yes, indeed. Days, you know, wasting away. Wasting away, you sleep your life. Mm -hmm. She didn't go around with a whip. That wasn't necessary. Her tongue could deliver potent lashes. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about sleep. You get enough of that when you pass on. Mm -hmm. She ruled with a velvet covered fist and tongue. Get Dream dashes more. And Mary loved dogs. She loved them, but she didn't pamper them. She usually had a dozen or more, depending on which female had just had pups, all sheltered in the underground storage bin. Hmm. They weren't there as watchdogs, but simply as a Mary's dog. A country woman from the Mississippi Delta. She hmm. also kept chickens, hmm. usually a rooster and three hens, because she liked fresh eggs and meat she had grown herself. Mm -hmm. No doubt in anybody's mind, what would have been done with a half acre of fertile ground out back? Mm -hmm. Dashes. A million white folks. No doubt her black Mississippi roots colored her relationship with white folks, including her weekly negotiation with Tarzan and Shortcoat. Mm -hmm. She wasn't in love with white folks, but she didn't hate them either. She just was just simply cautious and pragmatic. Let's say you find a hole with a rattlesnake in it and a hole with a white man in it. Mm -hmm. Jump in the hole with the rattlesnake. He ain't going to do nothing but bite you. Ain't no telling what that white man going to do. Mm -hmm. She had a whole bunch of those proverbs. Jews ain't really 100% white folks. <laughs> I'm telling you. I, I, well, she lived only a few blocks from Halsey's Maxwell Street a hub of Jewish entrepreneurial activity, so it was taken that she knew what she was talking about. Mm -hmm. She was a minch. This is called Back Portrait, and it's for Queen Zola Selena. <sighs> Back Porches. <coughs> Excuse me, let me wet my whistle. All right, I'm ready. Maybe I'm getting old. Isn't that what they say when you begin to recall scenes from the past, from your youth? Why does the Chicago back porch on the south side and the west side come in my mind? Charlie Bird Parker is definitely their catalyst, no doubt. The hard edge bop and the parallel realism that I listened to last night and many, many nights before did it. Of course, there are other factors, but I think the bird is the greatest. The first time I really heard what bird was doing occurred on the third floor back porch of the Dope Fiend building on Bourne Avenue. That's what the Dope Fiends had named the place, the Dope Fiend building. Humid, Chicago Southside summer night, extravagantly fragrant aromas drifting up from the garbage cluttered alley down there, mysterious giggles and seductive of laughter spilling from the porch above and bubbling up from the one below, deeper, more sensual sounds flavoring the atmosphere from the enclosed porch next door round about midnight. There are three of us on this set, Bobo, Mooney, and me. We are generously Rotating two short dogs of Richard's wild Irish rows and four semi spliff sized joints. Bobo's idea. Hey, if we're going to get high, then let's get high. Bobo was always being grandiose. Hmm. Bird is blowing star eyes. Da da, spa da 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 da
da da da da da da or something. It comes close to that. I don't have my horn with me. Mm. Too bad. Bird is blowing blue stars, and we three are sprawled back in a starfish circle. Bobo with his head on an ancient stray sofa pillow. Moni has rolled his t-shirt into a headrest, and I have woven a basket of my fingers on the wooden planks of the porch, all of us gazing into a sky that bird and the chemicalized wine and potent herb had created for us. Bird sounds blend with the sky. The moon sways and smiles with his rendition of Mama Inez. Da -da. Ba -da 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 da 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 Stars do ethereal mumbles with my blue suede chew. Ba da 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 with my blue suede shoes and from time to time simply recognizes the musical simply recognizing the musically infinite one of us will say hmm did you hear that play that back mm. and Moody the designated engineer played it back no CD here just a nice little one shot stereo with a fair sound system mm. courtesy of Bam and Baby June the neighborhood dope fans okay. right it would be like calling someone a negro or an oriental in this day and age, but back then the hero and folks were called, I'm sorry, the heroine and folks were called dope fan, and they took their addiction seriously. Tell us what you want, and if it's stealable, we'll get it to you for nightfall, okay? Oh, stereo, see you in 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Dope fiend black belts, mm -hmm. or oh, black belt dope fiend. Mm -hmm. We played cut after cut over and over after the smoke was smoked and the corner sucked off. Bird had done it again. Nothing else to talk about. He said it all. Slightly before dawn, a reality shocking time in Chicago, we staggered off the porch. How many summer nights did we do that? Lord only knows. But it was a ritual that I never resisted participating in the back porch. Yes, they are. And were front porches in Chicago on both sides of the town. But they never seem to have the mystique of the back porch. Mm -hmm. People sat, do sit on the front porches, but the mystery seems to evaporate the minute things go out front. The back porch, though the time frame I'm squinting into, was the place to enjoy sniff and sip whist sessions and well what the hell I was just prowling through the alley sitting next to a plump pretty faced walnut colored girl woman would be more interesting mm -hmm. what were we 14 15 years old mm -hmm. raging hormones lapping at our beaches uncontrollable tides surfacing mm -hmm. Think your mama would mind if I came up there and sat with you for a while? Shyly with downcast light brown eyes. She at work. Oh, slick me. Now we know what the threat is. Mm -hmm. How about your father? Would he mind? It was a more polite era. You couldn't just blunder up on somebody's back porch without identifying the situation. I was puzzled by the sad expression that tilted the corners of her mouth downward. He ain't here, she said. And I broke off the interrogation at that point and seated myself in the farthest corner of the low slung swing she occupied. Gorgeous evening filled with lively sounds coming from half a dozen directions. Music, vocal and instrumental. People having a party upstairs. The carbon smell of somebody barbecuing. We sat for a few beats, slowly swaying in the, sp in the swing. I stared at her twilight profile. A little snub nose, high cheekbone, funny colored eyes. She looked almost Chinese from my angle. First time I seen you around here. We just moved in Monday. Oh. Mm -hmm. On the honest to goodness level, I have to confess that I wasn't filled with wonderful things to say to this girl woman, but mm -hmm. I liked her right off. 
It has to do with her quietness. I felt at ease with her. Mm -hmm. She wasn't demanding that I spool off hundred yards of BS into her ears to have the right to sit with her on the swing. And thank goodness for that. Where would I have found some hundred words anyway? <laughs> What's your name? Mm -hmm. Karen. Karen Delphine Dumagier. That's a mouthful. <laughs> huh? <laughs> What's your name? <laughs> Karen. Karen Delphine Dumagier. I told her my name and we shook hands. We were so formal. I smiled whenever I think back on the scene. Dumagier. That's a French name, ain't it? You ain't French, is you? <laughs> Me. Making an attempt to be witty. She released the full face smile, the first one she'd given me since I arrived. No, I ain't French, but I'm from New Orleans, and lots of people got French type names down there. Oh? I had exhausted my basic fun of witty remarks. It was time to return to whatever I was doing in the alley. Well, uh, Karen looks like it's time for me to get on. The sad expression tilted her mouth corners down again. You want a glass of lemonade? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Was she trying to entice me to stay a little longer? Was she trying to become my girlfriend? What? I break the slow moving swing to a stop for her to get up. I could tell that she was pregnant the sec she was pregnant the second she made that crab like motion from the swing and placed her left palm in the back of her back. Be right back. Mm. I did a quick pan up and down the alley. The last thing I needed was to have Bobo, Mooney, Sheriff, and Leo, or any of my partners catch me hanging around a pregnant girl. I could hear them signifying in the back of my mind. Guess what, y'all? Hawked and got hold of bread that somebody else had already baked. <laughs> she came back out with a crystal cold pitcher of lemonade and two glasses. Sat them down on the porch in front of the swing. Help yourself. Thanks. Mm -hmm. wow. I poured us glasses of lemonade and settled back on the swing. I couldn't just chug a lug and run. Besides that, the enveloping darkness with a stray shift of light casting a strange glow on her face, I felt like getting to know her better. And I did get to know her better over the course of that vibrant spring into the heat of summer, but I never really felt that I knew her. I, I, I never felt I knew her. Crazy it may sound, that's the way I felt about her. Maybe it had something to do with her pregnancy and how she seemed to be a bit more bloated each time we met. <laughs> okay. I enjoyed kissing her and feeling her milk gorge breast, but it was like a stunted prelude, a foreplay leading to nothing. It didn't take a whole lot of neighborhood investigation to find out why her mother was always out in the streets after dark. She was a prostitute. Uh oh. Okay. Her beat was 39th and, and, and Cottage Grove. I never found out anything about her father other than, yeah, yeah. Mm. Summer was melting when she belly out to here informed me. We leaving. Oh yeah, we are moving to. <coughs> my nana and Sally and my auntie down in New Orleans want me to come back down home to have the baby. I think it was the first time she'd ever mentioned that she was pregnant. I was too embarrassed to talk about it. A few more strawberry sweet popsicle kisses and she was gone. No lingering hugs, no bittersweet tears. Bye-bye. Mm. Gone. Mm. I watched the winter snows inch up on the swing we used to sit on and remember that was all I could do. Many birds later hanging out with the wild ones in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park. I stared at this snub-nosed, walnut-colored profile sprawled on this blanket five yards to my left. Karen? The body was leaner, but more curved. The light brown eyes flaked from late nights and drugs. Karen? I thought it was you. I just knew it. We folded ourselves into each other's arms and just stood there, gently squeezing for a long beat. 
The boyish looking white girl who had been sprawled out beside Karen stood next to us looking puzzled. Oh, this is my friend Jean. Jean flicked a quick smile in my direction, grasped my fingers in a pseudo handshake and circled Karen's waist defensively. <laughs> Jean, this is somebody I used to know from Chicago. Another quick flickered kiss, a uh, flick, <laughs> quick flickered smile. Mm -hmm. It was time to move off the turf. Nice to see you again, Karen. Yeah, nice to see you too. Bro, take it easy. I made a nonchalant attempt to stroll nonchalantly away, feeling slightly frustrated. I want to ask her what she had, uh, whether it was a boy or a girl. What happened after you moved back to New Orleans? Where's your mother? What happened? Well, what the hell did it all matter now? Things were the way they were, and that's that. I didn't look back, and I haven't given the scene a lot of thought till right now. No need to focus on a Karen or the back porch jazz nights with Bird, Miles, Diz, Train, and all the rest of them. I could spend hours dredging up memories of what happened on the back porches of yesterday. No need to dwell on those times. They're gone. Even though the back porches are still there, maybe they always will be there. Maybe they always will be there. Back porches. Queen Zola Selena. Mm -hmm. And that ends Los Angeles, believe it or not. Right, right. You know, I was trying to read along out of your book, but I couldn't quite catch where you were. Don't worry about it. <laughs> I take it you were doing a writer's license to be creative. That's exactly what I'm doing. Oh. What is your next question? <laughs> okay. <laughs> If you expect the same thing to come out of somebody like me all the time, I know. Then, well, you know, I know you're you gonna be frustrated. All you fascinate life. me. You say like you write these books, and then when you pick them up, is you say to yourself, "Who wrote this?" They're gone. I think. I think in the best, I read uh, the Writers Digest and stuff like that, mm -hmm. the um, publication, mm -hmm. and I'm often struck by the time, by the fact that. Some of the writers become so attached to what it is they're doing that they've written, oh, I mean, two books in the last 43 years or something like that. Okay. I think that would be, mm -hmm. it's like having a, a pregnancy that lasts too long. No, you, you have the pregnancy of the writing. It develops and then <laughs> you push it off and give, say, bye, give, give birth, see ya. <laughs> give, them, give them a name. Okay. Try to give them a good home if you can find one. <laughs> right? And then go on to the next, next one. one. Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Definitely. I mean, uh, I, I, for a man, mm -hmm. I think it's the most wholesome thing you could do is to be pregnant three times a year. <laughs> with I, the, in, with, in the sense that we're With a new work. Okay. With new works, new works. works. Yeah. All right, fantastic. Yes. Well, Listen, I'm as a matter of fact, concerning all of that, uh, right now I'm involved with a, uh, I'm calling it a social science fiction fantasy fi fairy tale mm -hmm. about uh, a being who comes from another planetary system, which I'm not going to name right now, uh -huh. another galaxy, Yes. and finds himself in the middle of what we are now, pan, uh, pandemic, uh, 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 butchered, uh, completely butchered economy, in America only, mm -hmm. uh, being, being uh, dealt with, ah, God, I don't know what to call this man, but having uh, uh, the, the present occupant of the White House who seems like a psychopathic idiot. Uh -huh. And who's well, fooling was... enough people to believe that mm -hmm. <laughs> they should follow his medical advice mm -hmm. and do things like send their kids into uh, COVID-19 atmospheres and breathe all the viruses you can so that enough of them will die uh, in order for him to be elect re-elected president. I don't know of any office in any way, in any land mm -hmm. that you want to sacrifice to somebody's children to get into mm -hmm. unless it was... Uh, Hitler or somebody like that. Okay. So I'm with his I'm with his niece, uh, Mrs. Mary Trump. Yes, gotcha. I'm with his niece. Uh -huh. You know, she goes into uh, 
what did you call him? A malignant narcissist? Yes. With so many psychopathic tendencies and things oh. that uh, you wouldn't know where to start in order to try to determine who it is he is. And that's enough time wasted on that. Definitely. Okay. I will see uh, you in looking, the coming days. Looking forward with, to with your next week. All right. With a new work. Oh, yes, yes. We're going right. to tell stories. You know, I, I have to say this before we come to an end. And I may have said it on another occasion. I'm having enough response from people I know, mm -hmm. and some people I don't know, uh, who, I, I, I put it this way, I was feeling just a little bit teachy, guilty about mm -hmm. reading stories mm -hmm. that I've written over a period of time. And somebody said the magic things. Listen, mm -hmm. fool, mm -hmm. don't you know we get tired of looking at this terrible news and hearing all of this bad, crazy stuff? Take us on your trip, man. Yes. Keep us on your trip. One can escape in books to wondrous places. Oh, events oh. And thoughts. That did everything I needed to have done for me. And so I've been, I've been on a nice little very journey since uh, I was in, I was advised to to do that. So All right. here's looking at you, Zola Selena. Thank you, Zola and, uh, Selena I look Hawkins. To seeing you yes. When the camera goes off. <laughs> Your books <laughs> can be bought on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Did I embarrass you? Please. Your books can be bought on Amazon, Barnes and Noble. Your website is www.odiehawkins.com. If you like this video, if you like these moments in time on That's my station, that's what they are. Moments in time. Yes. Yes. Then uh, please subscribe or like or leave your comments. We deeply appreciate it. Thank you for your time, thank you for your time, and thank you for your time. Namaste. Namaste.